This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Seeing as we have a quorum of the Amherst Town Council connected virtually, uh, I will call this meeting to order at 6.37 p.m. on Monday, March 23rd, 2020. Uh, good evening. I'm hoping we have stable connection through Amherst Media so that those of you that are home are also able to join us. Yeah, I'd like to start with a roll call, and so be patient while people turn your mics on. And let me just start by saying, um, Shalini, are you here? Are we connected so the public can hear them? Patience gang. Patience gang. Patience gang. Patience gang. Patience gang. Okay. I'm now going to have to mute. Okay. Shalini, let's start again. Please speak up. We're not hearing her. Shalini, try again, please. Let's see, if I unmute, we're going to get just an echo all over the place. Shalini, can you unmute and speak? Sounds like elephants are nesting. Pat, can you hear me? So they can hear the they can hear that, but you can't. Okay, something. 
Well, no. Uh, was that Dorothy or? That was oh, Pat DeAngelis. Pat, Pat just heard that. Pat, can you hear me? Uh, all right, so I'm on extra. I'm on the speaker. We're just having tr trouble getting the sound in out from the town room out to everybody connected remotely. So we're working that out right now. We should have it figured out shortly. Challenging, can you hear me? And you can't, can you hear Lynn? Hi, I just want to let you know, Sean, I just heard from someone who's watching that they can see us and they can hear us well. They logged into the Amherst Media Channel 17. Thanks. So they can they can hear us, but I think what's happening is we're not getting the sound back from we're not getting the sound of the, of the microphones in the town room right now. So we're trying to figure that part out. But thanks. Um, all right, let's. So, Kathy, thank you for that report. Um, we're going to go ahead and start the meeting, but we really do need to figure out how later on you're going to ask questions, and that may be only be able to do it by typing the question to me. Okay? Yep, speakerphone, um, speakerphone. First of all, we want to thank all of the efforts for technology connection. We're trying to connect through two different systems. One is our yeah, my on air through Amherst Media. Uh, blasting because Lynn is talking about And that. the other one is through our Teams, which is the software we're using. Uh, so we've called the meeting to order. Um, I just want to mention that we have a couple other town council meetings. You'll hear later that we're going to be meeting every Monday, at least for the near future. Uh, those meetings will be at 6.30. So our next meeting is on March 30th. It'll, uh, it will include public comment, uh, and we will have instructions on how to make comment that in a live way, and those instructions will be available on the town website and on the agenda. Our second meeting uh, scheduled at this point is Monday, April 6th at 6.30 p.m. We will have other information about that. Uh, the stand, standing committees of the town council will call meetings starting with one that is going to meet on March 30th and the others not until the week of April 6th. We'll be more specific about that later. Uh, we have the joint meetings of the town council and the school committees to fill the school committee vacancy. We are going ahead with that. Um, we are scheduled to do interviews with candidates on Tuesday, April 14th at 6 o'clock. Uh, at this point, I would suggest those will be virtual. Uh, and then we also have a second meeting scheduled, if we need it, for Tuesday, April 16th at 6 o'clock. We will only use the second date if we have so many candidates that we need to interview them in a second night. If we do not meet on the 16th, we will make the decision regarding who which resident is appointed to the school committee on April 14th. I also want to mention there are many, many resources out there, both federal, state, and local. But one local resource you might want to check out is the Amherst Area Chamber of Commerce website where you look at open for business and you can see who's open and their hours and websites and so forth. Okay. So did the council not hear any of that? Okay. Um, 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 do you 
want me to try it again? Nobody said anything. Mm -mm. No. Can you type to them, say, we're still working on it? Those of you watching at home, we're still working on connecting the council so they can hear and we can hear them. I am muted. Can you hear me on that, end, James? You can see dialogue from the council. So. So one option is they all mute. I We go ahead with the presentations and um, all the questions, you just tell me what they asked. Why don't you ask them if they can see the screen? Can they hear us? Yes, we're testing now to see whether counselors can hear me. So I can hear you, Glenn, now. Are you guys able to hear me on that end? Yes. I can hear you, and I can hear Lynn. Okay, let's, wow. let's start with roll call then. Uh, Shalini Ballmill. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes, Alyssa is present. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, something just 
switched a little more again. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Present. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Evan Ross. Yeah, I'm here. Kathy Shane. She's here. You need to unmute. Kathy. All right, yes, here. Okay. Steve Schreiber. Here. Andy Steinberg. I'm here, present. And St Sarah Schwartz. I'm here, present. Great, thank you. So um, I'm hoping you can all now hear me. Thank you. Sorry for the delay. Um, I have announced additional meetings. Next Monday is the first uh, is one of those, and we will be figuring out how to do public comment and advertising how to do that before then. So I want to like to start with just an opening statement and just say tonight we'll go through the various ways in which the town of Amherst continues to prepare for and respond to the COVID crisis. And we will be meeting weekly for the indefinite future to keep the community updated and take whatever actions are needed. That includes how we hear from residents and respond to their questions and concerns, which we'll talk more about in a few minutes. Everything we say and do is occurring in a context that changes by the hour, actually the minute, and takes us into territory we've never seen before. It is unsettling to say the least for you and for us, but I wanna make a few comments about how we are approaching all of this as a community and what to look for as events unfold. First, I want to note some of the strengths on which we can rely going forward. Every community is different but Amherst has some things going for us that should give us confidence. The town staff is highly professional, experienced, and qualified to help us deal with whatever comes along. The town manager, our public health director, the leaders of our first responders units, and all the other prof professionals who act on our behalf are a resource many other communities envy. Similarly, our frontline staff from first responders to support staff in every area bring the highest level of skill and dedication to their work. We'll be thanking them all many times in the weeks and months ahead, but I wanna make sure to take the opportunity right now. It is at times like these that I appreciate just how important it is to have that kind of strength in place and how much it sets us apart from many other communities. Second, like every community, Amherst surely has its financial challenges, but only a little more than a year into our new form of government. I think all of us on the council have been struck by how strong a legacy of financial planning and management we inherited. Amherst has taken a careful and conservative approach to managing your money. We enter this period of uncertainty with strong financial reserves, one of the highest bond ratings in the state, and deep experience in getting value for our dollar. All of that will make a tremendous difference going forward. And I wanna thank the earlier generations of town leadership who left us so well prepared. Finally, quite apart from the formal mechanisms of government, we have a community that shares values of compassion, generosity, and concern for our common good. We are inescapably all in this together. And I think we can rely on each other to meet each challenge with intelligence, goodwill, and respect. So we approach a bad situation with many reasons to feel relatively good, but it remains a bad situation nonetheless. And in the coming weeks, we will need to rethink many of our existing assumptions and plans. Here are some of the main issues that you can expect to see the council working on. The town budget. The calendar requires us to make many decisions over the next few months about spending taxes and using of, in the use of reserves. The only thing we can be certain about, however, is that uncertainty will be our constant companion. No one can predict what the national and state economics economies will look like as we begin a new fiscal year on July 1st because cities and towns rely so heavily on state local aid, we must wait for developments on federal and state emergency assistance 
and state tax revenues and spending priorities before we have any clear idea of what our own budget will look like. Because so many residents and local businesses are confronting their own financial struggles, we must assume that local tax revenues will also be under tremendous stress. How we ultimately deal with all of that, of course, remains to be seen, but there is no question that business as usual is out the window, and we will need to approach budgeting with a clean slate, a clear sense of our priorities. I thank in advance the Finance Committee of the Town Council, the Town Manager, the Interim Finance Director and staff, and the school committee and the superintendent and his staff, and the library trustees and the director and her staff for their flexibility and innovation as we make and remake our budget. While none of us sign, signed up for this duty, we accept it and I feel confident that we will work together to reach the best solution for Amherst. The town staff, these are the folks we rely on, but whom we also often put in the most difficult situations. Just in the past few weeks, we've made major adjustments on how we deliver town services, including closing town offices to the public, but our commitment to excellence and responsiveness is unchanged, and we ask for your patience and forbearance as we take the steps necessary to provide services while keeping our service providers as safe as we can. And the future. Much of the Council's work in our first year focused on the future, preparing for discussion on our master plan and zoning bylaws, looking for opportunities to broaden the tax base, dealing with decades of backlog in investments in town, school, and library facilities. The present challenges may seem overwhelming, but one hallmark of a strong community is that it never takes its eye off the future. So we will continue to take, take as long a view as we can in the face of considerable uncertainty, but we will clear, clearly need to revisit some of our assumptions. One early example is our capital plan. Assumptions about state aid, local revenue, borrowing and availability of reserves will need to be carefully examined. Long-term commitments will need to be considered in the context of current needs and the prospect of uncertainty that may persist for some time. Again, I thank in advance all of the Town Council standing committees, including JCPC, the residents who serve on the, our many other town committees, and all the many stakeholders who must come together around a new set of facts and ask for the understanding of all as we find the best path forward in unfamiliar terrain. So many questions and regrettably few answers at this time. But I repeat my conviction that Amherst is well prepared to tackle these challenges as a community in the state. And I am proud to be working with such dedicated colleagues on the council who will have the, the unplanned opportunity to push the ship to full speed on its first voyage. I feel pretty good about that voyage and I look forward for all of you in Amherst to join us in this challenge. Thank you. So we're going to go on with our meeting and you'll understand a few of my comments as we go through. Um, we have no hearings tonight. Uh, we are not doing public comment tonight. That is actually allowed both by the governor's order and also by our own charter. However, we absolutely encourage and invite you to be in touch with us at towncouncil at amherstma.gov and also know that this meeting is being recorded and as with our meeting that was virtual a week ago, you will be able to view it on Amherst Media. So we're going to move on. There are no proclamations and commemorations, but we do have a presentation which is an update uh, from the town manager and our health director, Julie Fetterman. And then, late, then next will be our school superintendent, Mike Morris, and our head of senior services, Mary Beth. The council will be asked if they have questions or comments, and I may have to depend on someone else who's going to tell me that because I'm not getting the right thing on my screen. We have a few action items later, both in a consent agenda 
and then we have two actions in particular that we'll be taking with regard to the state of emergency and the budget deadlines. Uh, we also, as I mentioned earlier, we will be moving forward with the school committee, filling that vacancy and looking at our rules of procedure. Hopefully this will be no more than a two hour meeting because there is such a thing as virtual fatigue. Um, so let's move forward, if we will, with the presentations. Mr. Bockelman. I have it on. It's a so I, I will be using this microphone and make sure everybody can hear me at home and the counselors I will not be using the computer. So first off, thank you, Lynn, for those words. Um, they mean a lot to us uh, as staff. Uh, staff are working very hard during this uh, crisis and um, it really does mean a lot that the council has been supportive and respectful of the needs of the of staff. And um, I appreciate how you're bearing with us at time. That's a, a stressful time, but a time when we're trying to do the best that we can. So tonight, it's a snowy evening out there. Um, so one good thing about virtual meetings is that there's no such thing as a snow cancellation. Um, so uh, there's no excuse for not showing up if you are not here. Um, tonight, uh, like last week, uh, we want to I would like to make a status report on where we are as a town. And this is something uh, I've asked the council to have a weekly meeting so we can provide an update to all of the, um, for everyone um, on this, uh, everyone in the, in the community for where we are. First, um, so where we are, next slide, please. Good. Okay. And then, so this is our agenda for tonight. And we have a lot of slides, so please bear with us. We have a lot of information to convey to you and to the public. So next slide. So just to re, uh, re, uh, go back, the only, this is a similar slide to last, year, last week. The only thing that's new is the governor's order today uh, where he issued a stay at home order uh, this morning at 10 a.m. Uh, that is not a shelter in place order, it is not a curfew, it is a stay at home. And except for essential workers in there, in, in the packet is, the, is a copy of the order and is a list of the uh, uh, essential services that have been identified. It's about seven pages long of essential services, so it includes a lot of organizations that allows restaurants to continue operating in takeout. Um, so, uh, so that's the new thing today. Next slide. Next slide. There we go. So this is um, a, a slide that I prepared earlier and then um, got more information as of uh, this afternoon. So where it says 600, and this actually just helps to illustrate how quickly things are changing in the state of Massachusetts. In this slide it says there are 646 total cases. As of noon today there were 777 total cases. In the slide it says there were five deaths. As of noon today there were nine deaths. On the slide, it says 3,403 patients tested to date by Mass State Public Health Laboratory. Um, in, as of today, there's 3,722 patients who have been tested by the Mass State Public Health Laboratory. The slide says 2,601 additional to tests performed by, to date by commercial laboratories. That, now, that number is now 5,200. When you add up the new numbers that that it comes to 8,922 um, uh, people who have been tested. As, a, as the governor had, had promised, this has been a, a tremendous increase in the num number of tests. Um, of, the nine, of, the, of the 777 cases, six are in Hampshire County, the way I've uh, seen it. And the largest group, we'll talk about this in a little bit, the largest group of people age-wise are people in the 40 to 49-year-old range. So it's people between 40 and 49 who've been identified. Next slide. 
So in terms of the town of Amherst, our, the only thing that's new is the last bullet, which is uh, issued uh, as of today, so that only essential employees will be reporting to work on site. Um, other employees will be working remotely if they're able, um, but, and we have worked through, through this department by department. It's a, it's a uh, work in progress, so we continue to uh, uh, calibrate who should be at the office, who needs to show up, um, what work needs to be done. And I have to say, I really thank the town employees. Unknown who, participant is now joining. I want to thank everybody. Um, so it's, and it's a, um, uh, really appreciate the flexibility of all the um, uh, employees. Next slide. So I'm going to give you a quick status report of our core functions. So uh, again, uh, emergency management, emergency medical services, fire services, police services, dispatch, water treatment and distribution, wastewater treatment and collection, public works and roads, finance, including payroll, payables, purchasing, and, and health, of course. So just a few notes. I'm not going to go through each one one by one. Uh, from the police point of view, the calls for service are down. Um, they have um, increased, they have adjusted how they address certain complaints and using uh, social distancing as part, as part of their response plan. Um, they've, with all the businesses closed downstairs, downtown, they are uh, going door to door in businesses, checking the doors, checking uh, on a regular basis, checking to make sure the doors are locked, on foot patrols through downtown just to protect the property and other people who might be downtown. The one thing that they noticed also is that there is an increasing number of people who are calling to report groups of people standing too close together. Um, that's not necessary. We don't need that. But they, uh, I ask people not to. It's not something that we will enforce unless it's a large party. But if there are six people who are about to um, you know, take a walk and they're standing too close together, um, Okay. We've lost audio. Just your audio. Okay. Put your mic. Put your mic. Now it's back on. Test, test, test. Nope, nope, nope. Well, we'll keep talking and sing a little song. I can just do it. Please. Let me try this one. Test, test, test. Is that any better? No sound, but Amherst Media can hear us, so this is going to be very entertaining for everyone watching. But the council can't hear you. But the council can't hear unless they have the TV on. Right. Keep saying test, test, test to see if any of the counselors can respond if they hear this or not. Test, 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 test. test, test. Can the counselors hear now? now? Hear through that microphone, Paul. OK, 
Can I use this microphone or does this one work or not? Yeah, we can hear that. Can you hear us on your end? Yes. And we're not getting not getting feedback yet, so, so yeah, this will work for now. I had unmute it and that's why you got feedback. So I'm going to just catch up to where I think we were. I'm not sure if someone can text me if we um, did something differently. So as of uh, today, employees who are um, only essential employees will be who are doing essential tasks, employees who are doing essential tasks will be asked to come to work. That can, it, it's a range of people. It might be different on different days depending on what the task is that we need. Um, of course, of course, police and fire um, are essential. Our wastewater and water treatment plant operators are essential. Um, maintenance workers are essential. There are a number, you know, IT clearly is essential. And so making sure the town continues to work is um, how we'll be moving forward. So the, this slide that we're on now, I, meant, I mentioned that we, the calls for services are down from police and fire. Um, we have, the police department has been checking doors downtown uh, to protect the, the businesses, the property, to make sure, um, you know, it's a, because there's so few people downtown, it makes it uh, vulnerable. So they're on foot patrols, checking doors, walking through the town on a very regular basis. Police are highly visible um, going through the community because there is so, uh, so, much, so many fewer people out. Um, one of the things I mentioned, and sorry for if I'm repeating this, um, uh, what has increased are the number of people who are calling, reporting groups of people who are standing too close together. It's not necessary to do that. Unless it's a giant party, we're not going to respond to those. If it's a group of six people about to go on a walk and they're standing in too close proximity, it's not something our dispatch should have to resp re uh, respond to, nor our police officers. Um, for the DPW, as I mentioned earlier, it's snowing out. They will be addressing, you know, they're ready to, pre they're prepared to do the work necessary for this storm. Um, the wastewater and water treatment plant operators are all in good shape and ready uh, and coming to work. One thing I'd like to report is that the governor uh, established a child care for emergency worker program. And one of our um, treatment plant, one of our um, employees who is an essential employee, employee has utilized that service and said it worked wonderfully. His um, wife is a nurse, I think it is, and both had responsibilities to uh, respond to their work environment. And so this system that the state set up really worked well. Um, town hall, obviously we are on reduced staffing. Um, and then um, we've been adding operational capacity too. So today we had four firefighters who are coming off the either the call or the student force uh, being uh, uh, trained and, and educated through our HR system and they will be available to work as firefighters um, for, the, for the fire department uh, very quickly. We also uh, hired a new wastewater treatment plant operator who started today as well. So those are good uh, re, uh, additional capacities that we're bringing on. You can do the next slide. So we're talking about continuity of operations and that's our remote work, which we talked about. Our committee meetings have been canceled until April 3rd and I'll tell you that's a godsend to staff. Um, hope lost Paul audio. Sorry folks at home. So that we're not doing anything, um, it just is going in and out. It could be the weather, who knows. Paul, go ahead, try again. Test, test, test. Back, I think. So if I talk now, do people hear me? And if you back on. Okay. Yes, you're back, thank Great. you. Okay, so the continuity of operations I talked about. Committee means a godsend to um, the committees who, for not meeting just for our staff to be able to get themselves organized by uh, after April, we are preparing to um, start to implement in a lot, a lot of the committees who have been anxious to meet and we'll be able to do that successfully. Uh, communications, uh, we're providing regular updates. We're preparing a new website called Amherst COVID that will um, be dedicated to all information about COVID for the, for the foreseeable future and this will um, work with the school department to bring all the information together under one website. 
and we're getting ready for some online community forums. I know the counselors are eager to do this um, and staff are as well. So the next slide. So the next thing we want to do is go to the public health update. And again, our health director, Julie Fetterman is here and she has a few slides that she'll be able to walk through. Go to the next one. Good evening, I'm hoping that you can hear, hear me. Um, I was just with you a week ago um, and things have certainly changed in Massachusetts since that time, though not particularly in Amherst. So when we talk about containment of this disease, we're looking at the, disease, the, the tools of isolation and quarantine. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about those um, as I go down to the bottom of this slide. But isolation and quarantine are the beginning stages of social distancing. Everyone has been hearing about social distancing and what that means, staying six feet away from other people. Um, at this time, as we're seeing community spread of the disease in Massachusetts, more in the eastern part of the state, we're also looking at mitigation tools. So a mitigation tool is when we start limiting gatherings. So as we saw today when the governor said that now we're only going to be allowing groups of 10 people and shutting down of businesses except for the ones that are essential. This is all part of this, this spectrum of social distancing. People will be able to get out and get food, prescriptions, go to MD appointments, and go to work if they have essential jobs. As Paul referenced earlier, that list is on the website and is also in the governor's order, which you're seeing on television and in the newspaper. Staying at home means that people need to stay home, only to go out for essential activities. The other pieces of social distancing we've talked about before, which are washing your hands, well, no, these are hygiene. Social distancing is staying six feet away from other people, staying home. And we know that this is a really difficult thing to do. This is so many people are struggling with the isolation of this. But if we all pitch in and take these measures, we're hoping that we can flatten the curve. At this time, and I'll talk more about that, at this time, we have no vaccine. It will take at least a year to develop a vaccine. This is true with all vaccine development. That's not unusual for this particular disease. It just takes that amount of time to actually develop a vaccine and feel co confident that it can be introduced into the public. In terms of treatment, there, there is work being done to look into antivirals that could treat this disease. There are promising studies being done. At this time in Massachusetts, we don't have treatments that are being used. So when we talk about flattening the curve, what we're talking about is not overwhelming our hospitals and medical system as we, as we see now. I'm sorry, Paul, there's another slide where we're gonna look at the curve, right? So okay, I'm gonna go on to that then, because I think it'll be, it'll be more clear. Oh, but let's go back, because first all, sorry about this. Um, I'm still getting used to all this technology also. So I wanna talk about exposure and diagnosis. So people can become exposed to the coronavirus by touching surfaces, or by being around someone who is actively coughing and sneezing and then spewing out droplets. I know I talked about this last week, so I think I don't go, need to go into that. But those are the ways in which people are contracting the illness. When someone touches a surface that has the virus on it and then inadvertently touches their face, then that virus can enter through the nose, the eyes, and the mouth. Testing is something you've been hearing a lot about lately. Um, as you can see from what Paul was just telling you about the Department of Public Health, testing is really ramping up in Massachusetts. One of the things that means is that we're also going to see more cases diagnosed. So in some ways, that will, this will be providing a picture that will look alarming, 
but because we didn't have the availability of tests before, we weren't always able to diagnose who had disease. Physicians were having to go by clinical signs and symptoms. Now we're going to have the ability to test people and get a good sense of how many people test positive, and then the people who test negative also, because that gives us information about how the disease is spreading in the community. A positive diagnosis, which as I said before, was being done just by clinical symptoms, but will now mostly be being done by a test, results in two or three things. If someone tests positive for COVID-19 and they are severely ill, then they're going to be hospitalized and isolated in the hospital. But the majority of people won't be severely ill. They will be told to go and isolate at home. Isolating at home means staying in their own bedroom, hopefully using their own bathroom, and staying isolated from their household members and the rest of the community until their symptoms are gone, and it's been at least seven days since the start of their symptoms. Now that we're seeing more testing being available, they should also be able to get a negative test. If they're unable to get a test and have that come because there's still not enough tests to test those who are recovering, someone who's had no fever for 72 hours after that initial seven days and, the, um, uh, and no more symptoms, then they also can be considered able to go out of isolation. Quarantine is when people have been exposed or, or possibly exposed to someone who's positive for COVID-19. Quarantine and isolation are essentially the same, except that in quarantine, someone is not ill. They're monitoring, monitoring their temperature, monitoring their symptoms for two weeks. It's two weeks because that's the incubation period for the disease. At the end of two weeks, if they've had no symptoms, then they are released from quarantine and are considered healthy. Okay, next slide. So this slide shows you the spread of COVID in Massachusetts. I don't know if you can read the dates on the bottom. If you orient yourself, they're sideways. So you can see that on March 6th, we started with five cases. There was a bump at March 10th where we went up to 50. And at around March, March 15th, we started seeing a big uptick so that now we are at more than 646 cases, as Paul said. The new numbers were released at noon today. So what this means, as I started to talk about last week, is that we're really in the acceleration phase with this disease in Massachusetts. This is why it's now incredibly important for everyone to be doing what they can with social distancing, staying home, using incredibly good hygiene, which we're all not used to, washing our hands so frequently, not touching our faces. This is what could turn this tide in Massachusetts. This slide is very interesting. I want you to see that on the left, we've got 19 and younger, and on the far right, 70 and older. So early on, as, as things were being discovered about this virus, what was thought was that young people could be spreading the disease, but that they weren't going to get sick. But as you can see here, this age dist distribution from 20 to 29, we had 93 cases. This is as of March 26th. And then from 50 to 59, we had 119. So if you look at the 20 to 50 year old group, you can see that there are many cases out of this total. So we're finding out that young people are getting sick. One of the differences in why we see deaths of more older people is because they have underlying medical conditions. It doesn't mean that young people don't, but older people have...
Okay, I'm back. Can people hear me? Okay, so the purpose of this slide is just to show that younger people are getting sick. And that's a message that we really need to share with family and friends because early on there were messages going out that young people would not be getting sick, and they are. We also know that they are carriers. So it's very important for us to think of that as a whole population. This is a change from what we were initially thinking. All right, here we are at the curve. I know you all have seen this many times, but what you're looking at is a red bump which shows what will happen without protective measures. And the blue part of the curve is when we do have protective measures. The dotted line represents our healthcare system capacity. This is important for many reasons, but two of them are that unless we can slow down the rate of disease transmission, our healthcare system will become overwhelmed. What that will mean is that people who need to be hospitalized for COVID, who need specialized medical care, will not be able to get all the care that they need. But it also means that those with other types of health conditions who are going to be needing the healthcare system, needing the hospital, are also possibly going to be able to go, going to have to go without the care that they need. So it's imperative now that everyone takes the steps, each individual, that could help to flatten out this curve. That would mean that our hospitals would not become overwhelmed, our physicians and nurses and nurse practitioners and physician's assistants who are already getting very taxed would not be sent into further excess workloads. So we're really asking everyone to join in doing what they can to flatten this curve. Okay, it's back to me. Um, and again, for those watching or those participating, we apologize for the delays that's happening and there's a lot of strain on the system right now. So the next slide um, is, we want to, I'm gonna run through, I'm not gonna repeat things I said last week, uh, but these are the sort of core things that we look at on a daily basis uh, with, our, with our core or team. Next slide. Just to organize yourselves again, this is our um, team that's in, uh, that's been that's regularly working multiple hours a day together and then going off and doing additional projects. We are, we of course have supporting people who are supporting us in every role and we're expanding those support teams as we, as we work. Uh, things that we are looking for currently is we are going, to, we're reaching out for volunteers. Meals on Wheels needs volunteers who will come, who will um, pick up meals and deliver them uh, properly socially distanced to people who, to el elders who need them at home and, and have them uh, participate. We also have a CERT, CERT team, which I don't even know what it stands for, but it's a group of people who are, have always been ready and prepared to provide additional services during an emergency. So we'll be tapping their expertise soon. So next slide. So one of the, again, we talk about force protection and that's sort of, it sounds like a military term. It, and not, I think it comes from that, but this is about making sure that our employees are, are healthy and safe and there's redundancies in place so that we can continue to serve the public. Police and fire, it's obvious. Um, we have closed the town buildings to, uh, to the public and have told people to work from home. Key is our water and wastewater treatment plants and keeping those operating. School buildings and the libraries are closed. Uh, if there is an incident, we, this is our incident command team, uh, the fire chief and emergency management director Tim Nelson, health director Julie Fetterman, police chief Scott Livingstone. I think um, you know, Tim is probably the baby on that of the, in terms of years of service. So we have multiple, so many years of service here, people who've worked together, who've worked through crises in the past, high level of com communication and trust. And it's, it's really terrific to have this team ready to, to respond. Because when you respond, it's not always formulaic. You have to make decisions on the fly. You have to say, can you handle this? this I got this. And so it's really impressive and important for the town to have these uh, really strong people there representing us. Uh, continuity of operations. Um, 
the um, these are where the virtual meeting technology, we're working on it. Uh, IT is evaluating multiple different um, uh, options, including the one we're using now, including Zoom, uh, looking at the technology in the town room and how we can communicate that way. Uh, a lot of these systems are being stressed, but by Wednesday we will have settled on, or hopefully this week, we will settle on um, a, 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 for, a platform that will work on for our meetings and then start to, roll that out to staff who will support the, the uh, people who are uh, calling meetings. Um, and, there, and so we ha we'll have that this week. And um, as we prepare for those meetings, our staff uh, are spending the next week and a half to, be, to get the agendas ready for the committees who are going to be ready to meet, getting materials, making sure that they have access to everything they need so that those meetings can be successful, that they're not just people join, going online and chatting is, is we want these meetings to be productive so everybody's time is, is utilized well. Next slide. So uh, in this slide, this, there are um, the bottom three bullets are new. I did a um, brief video to staff um, and just to sort of connect with folks because it's, it really is isolating when you're um, working in a small with a smaller group instead of seeing the people you see on a daily basis it's isolating for people at home so having that connection to folks is really important uh, the town council president and I speak daily in terms of and, and I update her on anything that happens and in, in, um, and just pretty much transparent for with all the things that were that are in play and providing and trying to get better at this providing regular updates to the town council um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of things flowing through here all at the same time. I try to get as much out as I can to the council. And I, I really find that this, um, this uh, meeting is an important thing for that. On the other hand, I talked about a new uh, website uh, that our um, communications manager, Brianna Sunred, is leading a team of employees who are going to be working from home to build it in the very near future. We're looking at Facebook Live events and a number of other things that we will be working on. Next slide. So one of the things that, that's different this week is the students from UMass and who are oops, on break. Um, are we up? So Julie is going to stay until there are questions at the end. Um, it was one of the questions. Um, we ready? We going okay? Everybody can hear? Okay. So communication. So one of the things that's new this week is that the students are back. Um, there are about 8,000 students that live off campus at uh, UMass, and that's in multiple towns, not all in Amherst, but there are, they are eligible to come back if they've paid rent and they want to stay living in the town or wherever they are. Um, the UMass reports about 609 students living on campus who will continue to live on campus. They're congregating them into several different dorms uh, to make management better. And I think Amherst College has said they have a couple hundred students who are on their campus as well. This, the university has put together this, um, this um, flyer to send to people who are coming back and helping to educate people about social distancing and the importance of that in their lives as well. So the next. So tonight, um, we're going to be talking about um, the elder community and food security. And in future meetings, we hope to be talking about local businesses and um, the, our homeless community and the number of things that we're working on on those. So for, first tonight, we have our superintendent of schools, Mike Morris. And he's, he's dialing in, so I wonder if he can hear us and if you want to take over, Mike. Sure, I just want to make sure people can hear me. Is that coming through? It is. We can hear you. Okay, great. So I can't see the slides because of the it's not synchronized with the video feed that I have. So I apologize for being directive on slides. But uh, thanks for having me tonight. I appreciate it. I mean, uh, I know Paul mentioned he speaks to the town council president every day. Uh, Lord knows how many conversations Paul and I have had over the last couple of weeks. Uh, but it's critically important from the school's perspective that we're close uh, and aligned with what the town's doing because um, because of the obvious connections between the two. So I really want to thank Paul and his core team because we communicate all the time, and it's critically important uh, during this time 
during this difficult time that uh, we're working all together. And uh, I want to, you know, share that uh, the school side, we really appreciate the support of the town. Um, so if we're on slide, I guess going ahead to slide 25, um, just going backwards a little bit, there were there was increasing concern uh, on the week that ended March 13th. And um, at, uh, for us, we woke up on March 13th that Friday. There was a conference call with the commissioner and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, there was uh, some superintendents thought that maybe there would be a forced closure. Some weren't sure. Uh, we woke up on March 13th confident with the information we had that we were going to make a closure decision regardless of what uh, the commissioner and the state did, and, and we did do that. So at about 11.15 that morning, we had a video shown to every student uh, pre-K to 12, actually two different videos, one for elementary, one for secondary, announcing that the schools would be closed for two weeks. Uh, two days later, the governor announced a three-week closure of all schools in Massachusetts with the earliest return date of Tuesday, April 7th. I will share that uh, at this point, there's uh, a lot of questions about that return date, and we continue to have conference calls with the commissioner on at least a weekly basis. Um, and we're trying to plan for multiple scenarios of potential returns uh, because we're really the uncertainty of the situation and, and what the advice will be with all the charts uh, Julie showed earlier, I think one, one might start to question the April 7th date, uh, but we're going to wait and see what the commissioner does. Uh, and again, if he makes a decision that's not aligned to what we feel like we need to do for public safety, as we did before, we'll, we'll make the decision that we feel like is in the best interest of our community. Um, the next slide, 26, talks about communication. And the reason it's so early in this uh, slide deck is it's so critical to be, um, to be communicating out with our constituents what's happening. Um, at our website, which there's a link to, it links to all 12 letters sent home to families and staff about the situation as it evolved. Um, it sort of acts like an oral history a little bit of the uh, of the last couple of weeks as well, um, in the tone of the letters and the information we shared out. And I want to particularly thank Julie Fetterman, who has been a uh, just a complete rock in giving us advice, advising us and about what to communicate and how to communicate accurately with the public because she's been, she's been a great resource. Uh, we're trying to maintain our weekly communication. So our weekly newsletter goes out on Friday. Granted, this Friday's uh, a couple days ago was mostly about this uh, COVID-19 issue, but we're maintaining those kind of structures. Uh, we had staff specific communication throughout the situation. So multiple, multiple emails to staff. Uh, one of the things that we found, and Paul referenced this a little while ago, is that, uh, and this came from a staff member, it wasn't my idea, uh, there's so many emails that's relying on electronic communication. So I did a, a short video for staff that was positively received. And, and I think uniquely, uh, the thing that felt unique to me was how many people said uh, in, a, in a relatively big organization, how nice it was to see a face and hear a voice. And, and we've taken off on that. So our principals have recorded uh, video um, videos to their students and families. Um, I think most of the elementary principals anyway already have finished their second video and sent that out. And again, the, the piece around the social distancing, which Julie talked about, which we're absolutely practicing, uh, but also the, the, the contrast to social isolation, just being concerned about students and families and, and having the visual representation, particularly of principals, has been critically important for us and something we'll continue into the future. Uh, and we've maintained our, our regular meeting schedule. We've met a lot more often than that, but we're, we're maintaining our regular meeting schedule with school and district leaders so that we continue to function as a team and, and keep some structure in a somewhat less structured time. If we could go ahead to slide 27, um, from a health perspective, uh, we were fortunate last year to get a grant from the uh, Department of Public Health, and we now have a nurse manager uh, who works closely with Julie Fetterman, uh, also closely with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and local health, uh, public health officials. Uh, I just want to note that there's a plural for a reason on public health officials. Um, Julie is our contact in the town of Amherst, but we're a regional district, and uh, all four towns don't share Julie. Um, and um, so we've worked with multiple public health officials uh, on this one. Uh, one of the big focuses was making sure that families got student medications on Friday and then uh, some picked them up on Monday of uh, a week ago to make sure that families had the medications they needed given that um, we, we, we had a feeling that, you know, get, picking up medications is going to become a little more complicated in the future. Uh, and the nurse managers also done a great job of fielding staff questions, concerns uh, that go on during this, this time as well as family concerns. Go ahead to slide 28. Um, 
So uh, in 48 hours, we, our wonderful staff took what they were doing and tried to transition to a model of distance learning. Um, the guidance of the state has been up until this point that it's enrichment activities for all students. Um, we're not trying to, we're not a university setting where we're trying to zoom six-year-olds into uh, an active meeting uh, zone uh, situation the same way you would do perhaps with college or graduate students. That being said, uh, our teachers have been making strong connections. For instance, our college counselor shared she had 23 meetings last week with different families because this is a pretty critical time for our 11th grade students and thinking about college. Uh, and I know some of our, our staff are using all different forums um, to maintain contact, whether it's Google Classroom, which is pretty uh, used pretty ubiquitously across the district, Class Dojo, uh, other tools that were existing and then enhancing their use. And we're fortunate that we have uh, strong technology systems in place because we're not recreating. We're really enhancing what uh, the technology was previously doing. Uh, again, maintaining strong communication with families and students and continually addi adding additional online resource lists um, so that families are supported in working with their students, uh, their children rather, at home. If we could advance to slide 29, again, I'm trying to uh, be conscious of, of your time. I know you have other things on your agenda. Uh, one of the things that immediately surfaced was um, the, the issue of food scarcity and what can we do for our families. And so, uh, again, school let out on the 13th, which was a Friday. Um, that following Tuesday, we started our meal service. So last week, we served over two, it was actually 2,058 meals um, to students over four days, uh, Tuesday through Friday of last week. And uh, we know that many of our families uh, getting to school uh, would be a barrier for them. So we set up locations in uh, high density uh, areas um, that had more than their share uh, of families who let us know that food scarcity was a major issue for them. So I really want to thank our Family Center, our food service staff who came in, uh, and the many staff volunteers who uh, showed up to help with delivery at those sites. Um, we're fortunate that this week, uh, today actually, we started a partnership with UMass, and they're assisting us with about half the sites, which is reducing the load on our food service and volunteer staff, uh, just because we are interested in sustainability uh, long-term, because we don't know how long the school closure will last. I will note that um, some of the concerns that our staff are hearing in the community as the uncertainty of the school closure lasts is how long will, you know, these food services um, be able to continue. And, you know, we're trying to, again, focus on sustainability because we don't know if this will end up being an even longer term closure. Um, but it's been well appreciated by our community and well supported by our staff. Um, you can go ahead to slide 30. Um, so technology, so our grade 7 through 12 students have Chromebooks. It's a, we have a one-to-one -one program that's fully functional. Um, however, in grades 3 to 6, uh, there are Chromebooks per student, but they stay in the school. And we surveyed all, all families in that, those grade levels, and to date we've uh, uh, loaned out 97 Chromebooks, uh, which is a lot if you think about, um, you know, four grade levels. That's a pretty high percentage. Uh, to families so that they can be using it. And that's really all the work of our IS staff and, and a perfectly socially distanced world. Julie would have been thrilled to see uh, the way it was done, three long tables, gloves, and, and how they checked them in and out. And we're also providing a lot of technology support for staff to be able to know how to contact families without using, you know, for instance, private cell phone numbers, uh, other ways to contact families who maybe don't have Internet access, uh, so we're actively working on those uh, right now and continue to add to our list of tools that our staff have access to. And the next one's my last slide. Um, so this is something that I've talked to the town staff as well about and their core team. But uh, what we know is that uh, despite our best efforts and families, the feeling of social isolation is going to affect uh, probably everyone in this current situation. Um, so our counselors are making regular routine um, connections with our students who perhaps are most at risk in this situation. We've developed protocols for students who may be struggling, especially with the current context. And um, I think we um, want to maintain and do everything we can do to support students and families in this way. And we're fortunate to have a strong team of, of kind of therapists, clinicians uh, who are actively working with students uh, on the current experience, which is a novel one, um, you know, for some, perhaps the stereotypical view might be, oh, students, you know, students aren't in school, they're going to be enjoying that, it's, it's less stress, but, but in fact, what we're hearing from our students is 
the structure of school, the social relationships that occur between both students and students and as well as them and, and the faculty are really grounding experiences. And without that, we're trying to fill the void as best we can in the current context. And um, I think our staff have risen to the challenge, but the longer this, uh, the closure goes on, uh, the more we're going to have to really be connecting with families and students and being cognizant of the strain that this is putting uh, on everybody involved. And, and, and the last thing I'll say, and then I'll stop or pause anyway, is just also the piece around making sure that our staff uh, are, are practicing self-care. Um, so our staff are working incredibly hard, but they also now have either, many of them have their own children at home, they're taking care of family members, uh, as well as trying to attend to the needs of their students in a very new way. And so one of the critical messages we have been is just making sure that our, our staff are, are taking care of their colleagues, are checking in routinely, are letting their supervisors know what's going on in their life, if it's getting in the way of, of their work, uh, because this is a stressful situation for everyone involved. And the language I continue to use is, is in my personal opinion, is this will be a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, it doesn't always feel that way uh, to many of us, but but I think it's the truth. And so when we think about mental health in the slide, it was primarily focused on students, uh, but we're taking active steps to try to support our staff in practicing self-care during an uncertain uh, and certainly atypical time that has a lot of stress for everybody involved. And, and if our staff can feel positive and supported, you know, they'll do a much better job working with our students. And that's been our approach throughout. Thank and I think that's my last slide. Yep, this is Paul again. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, there are a couple, um, well, first off, I want to write back at you on being a good partner. You're highly com communicative and it's really terrific for both sides, uh, schools and towns to work together. There are a couple questions counselors had, and one was, sure. um, you know, so much of the world has gone online, but some of our families do not have access to the internet. And uh, can you share a little bit about the efforts that the, uh, the school district has made to try and connect folks to the internet? Yeah, so uh, that is one of the biggest, uh, if not the largest um, kind of pieces that's, that's a large piece we're still working on. And, and uh, you know, I'll just tell a story because I think it's illustrative of the issue. Uh, so we were all set with a purchase order to buy mobile routers, uh, like mobile hotspots, excuse me, mobile hotspots for families. Um, and uh, we heard from four districts right before we purchased them that, uh, the data plans that come with those are insufficient for the expectations that students would, how much data they would use, especially at the middle school and high school level, that after 90 minutes their data was done and so it wasn't an effective strategy uh, and the districts felt like they'd, they'd spent a fair bit of money to not have much payoff. Uh, so we are working, you know, the Comcast, some of the other companies have uh, kind of free 60-day kind of models uh, with certain requirements. We're working with some families around that. There are some barriers to that. Um, and uh, one of the next steps we took is reached out to the colleges and universities trying to see uh, if, if someone who is used to maybe high debt. Like we lost you. Families who don't have connectivity live okay, uh, right. had some thoughts about a different way to approach this. But um, that, so it's something we're still actively working on. If anyone listening to this out in the community has ideas about uh, how to approach that task, you know, morrism at arps.org, we are open for ideas because it is something that much like many, many districts we are struggling with and uh, kind of the frustrating part is when we think we might have a solution, uh, you know, the, the glitches and, and and other barriers, we don't want our staff going into homes to install uh, pieces of equipment, even if we had it, right? That would not be consistent with social distancing. Uh, so that's another barrier for us if we had a, a technology solution that involved uh, an IS staff person going into people's, uh, where people are living. Um, so again, we're still working on it. We're not giving up by any stretch, but it is a real barrier. Uh, and um, it's something we're actively working on. Thank you, Mike. And then there's one other question. And uh, the food program, I think, has been really impressive. And the question was, if you need volunteers, I know we need volunteers for the Meals on Wheels program, but does the school district need volunteers or do you utilize current staff to help connect with, with students? Yeah, I mean, it says a lot about our teachers, uh, paraeducators, clerical, everybody that we've actually had such an abundance of volunteers that we have sad people today who, as we shrunk our sites, because UMass took over some, uh, because 
I mean, we told them they can certainly go, but we're, we're in good shape with volunteers. Uh, our staff have been just abundantly helpful and uh, not only wanting to do that, but also just at a safe distance to see faces and for our students to see familiar faces. And one of the things I've noticed is a lot of the people have wanted to volunteer, in the, especially the elementary level, in the parts of town where they work in. So a lot of Parker Farm staff were wanting to volunteer in South Amherst so they would see kids and be a familiar face. And uh, long-winded answer is I think we're in really great shape right now on, on the volunteer part. If that changes, I'll certainly go through Paul and, uh, and we can let folks know. Great. Thank you so much, Mike. So now we have Mary All right, Beth thanks. Take care. So we have Mary Beth Lovitz uh, warming up in the bullpen. And uh, <laughs> so. Unknown participant is now exiting. Bye, Mike. Um, so now we have, uh, go to the next slide. So Mary Beth, can you hear us? Good evening. Can everybody hear me? We can hear you in, town, can you in hear the town me? room. In, we can hear you in the town room. Great. It looks like other people can. It looks like it's coming up on the screen yep. that the town council can hear me. You got Super. It. So I have a similar situation to Mike in that um, the video feed that I'm looking at on my desktop is not synchronous or showing the slides that I'll be using. So I'm going to just trust that you're going to flow along with me on my slides that I'll be presenting. Is that okay? That's right. We got it. Great. So if you would come down to the first uh, content slide that says resources staff. The main message that I would want to share tonight is that the building is closed, but all of the staff members that you see on this slide, including myself, are still working each and every day. So one of the things we noticed is when we closed the building here at the Bank Center and closed the uh, Senior Center, there was a precipitous drop in phone calls and inquiries. And so we have been working hard to message that we are still all here, though some folks are working uh, remotely. I am here every day. I try to make myself viewed and uh, people know that I am around and I'm available. And so if we can share that message tonight, that would be extremely useful to let people know that we are all still working and we are available. In terms of our staff, we are in a great position. Uh, other senior centers, I'm, I'm part of a listserv of Western Mass senior centers. Some have been closed because of sicknesses. There's a local um, senior center where 20 of 21 staff members are homesick. We are all well and we are all working. Um, the only place in which we have seen an impact has been our volunteer base, as one would expect. People are making some really wise choices based on uh, their vulnerability and um, their age and stage with regard to complicating medical conditions. But we are rapidly rebuilding that core. So um, if you'd switch to the next slide, resources, knowledge, connection, and programs. Um, we remain strong. So we know our people in the community, and we also know how to get things done. Our key asset really has, is the depth of knowledge of our social workers, our connection with the community, with the people we serve, and also our external partners. So none of that has been impacted by COVID or um, some remote operations. And that's something that I think is, is really critical for the seniors in the community to understand that we are still fully functioning. And then the second key asset has really been our food programs. And our food programs, despite UMass closing that Meals on Wheels program, we have been able to successfully transition all 38 folks who have been supported with various meal plans and or support services. Um, when the UMass Meals on Wheels plan closed, those individuals were all phoned three times by myself and with a social worker three days in a row to make sure that not only that they had plans in place, but that the plans were actually working and functioning. Uh, we continue to have contact with those individuals, and so far um, everybody is being very well served in the various ways. Not only do we contact the individual clients who were part of that program, but also their family members and other informal support systems, including PCAs or healthcare workers who were part of their whole system of support. Next slide. In terms of our operations, if someone were to ask me why are we strong, I would say it all had to do with the town manager directing us long before this occurred to begin and engage in continuity of operation planning for this 
before it was necessary. So we had plans in place. We had lines of successor authority. We had um, identified our list of vulnerable clients and also the essential tasks which we needed to uh, continue to engage in in order to serve those individuals. We also knew that the volunteer base would um, change radically uh, based on everything that Julie would be sharing us about um, risks and exposure to COVID-19. And so we began to anticipate needing new volunteers and beginning conversations with individuals who primarily were under 60 to anticipate that. Next slide. Here's a quick outline of sort of where we have been. Um, so primarily at the outset, it really was to communicate and message for seniors that this is going to be a radical departure from their prior ways in which they interacted with us and with each other. So we had to message social distance and also the safe practices that were shared with us through the town. Uh, we engaged in individual calls. We engaged in visits. We also, I did a recorded robocall. We have a database system, which is fantastic. And I was able to place a call uh, within days of us closing you know, uh, assuring people that we had a plan in place and that we were still open. And I had received many phone calls and also emails as a result of that first recorded call for people to say that that was a very reassuring um, engagement with them. We also updated our website with COVID-19 relevant information, and we also used our social media and, and those sorts. So beyond messaging them, Well, Hold on, Mary Beth, you're, you went gone in and out a little. With bit. intersectionality, so that could be, um, you know, the intersection of their natural support, language, and family status. So each of the social workers can discuss cases. There are approximately 56. Mary Beth, can you hold on one second? most frail and vulnerable seniors, which are being followed on a daily basis. She's not hearing you. Did a resource list, which I think has been invaluable for the community, and we are in the process of sharing that. And in so that resource list really relied on the aspect of social distance and how can they continue to um, gain the things that they need just for activities of daily living. And that would be delivery of medication, delivery of food, all of the various food sources. Um, so we prepared some lists. We shared those um, in flyer form. We also have them on our website. And I believe tonight you were shared a PDF of our Senior Spirit newsletter. And that has been... Um, if you were to ask me about the digital divide, that's a reality for this um, group. And so we have to do far more one-to-one -one, um, communication so that folks know what is out there and available for them. We also instituted a call a neighbor friendly uh, phone call list. So we are matching and it's an online fillable uh, form on our website. So folks can access and you, and you can also sign up a senior to receive a call. Uh, I prepared a, a checklist um, and sort of the purpose of that is not only to help people to engage socially, but also to be going through um, the indicators that we would be concerned about, about mood, depression, um, food, and sleep, and then that there is a referral back to us if there are any concerns as a result of those phone calls. Next slide. So where, where are we in terms of what we're um, providing? The services really that we are focusing our efforts on is first and foremost social work services. So we continue again calls and check-ins of frail and vulnerable clients. We also rely extensively on informal um, means of communication. So um, our ability to be present, to hand out meals, to participate in the Meals and Wheels program, speaking to individuals even as they're walking by, keeping that six-foot difference. We know each other, and we can rely on that just to do a check-in. How, how are things at Clark House? How are your friends? So we're always going through um, uh, eliciting information on what the status is because I will say that we're used to seeing over 100 people a day, and that's how we kind of keep our close contact is 
uh, that visual. And so we're just having to sort of exponentially grow that by not just our staff doing it, but using um, the friendly phone calls and those other so, uh, means of support. Uh, the social workers are continuing to do referral and assistance, so they're still working with clients actively to assist them if they have any um, issues around food insecurity or delivery of medication. We have assisted people to obtain uh, medication from pharmacies when they've been unable and they had no other um, sources of support. And they also continue to coordinate services, and that's where really our extensive relationships with our external partners really help to shore us. So we work with a number of PCAs and also um, healthcare agencies. We work on a daily basis with Highland Valley Elder Services, which is the access point for home health care, nursing services, as well as Meals on Wheels, and then also individuals who might have questions about Mass Health, Medicare, SNAP, and housing. So all of those services are remaining in place. They're just taking place over the phone. And then the second prong um, of our effort is focused on food and making sure that folks know where to go and how to access it. Our congregate meal, which was our community meal, with the focus was, uh, and intentionally by the, the Title III funding, the focus of that was socialization. It is now around reaching out to individuals and making sure that people are getting proper nutrition. So we were able to shift with the assistance of Highland Valley from a congregate meal to a cold takeout lunch. And... Um, this is if um, anyone is watching or is able to share this information, we continue to share that that meal is free to anyone age 60 and above in the town of Amherst. So anybody can come here um, and have that meal. We just need to have a two-day in advance notice for that. So that is different than Meals on Wheels. It's um, administered by the same organization, but it's it's an entitlement if you have reached this age and you would like to have a free lunch, you are entitled to that free lunch. Um, I am in the process of recruiting volunteers because one of the things that um, I, I think is, is perplexing about this is that um, Highland Valley has shifted that to a takeout lunch at the same time where we're telling people don't leave your home. And so if I can get enough volunteers, I can shift the daily takeout lunch to one that could be delivered um, to individuals through the community. I have a number of individuals. I've also been um, working with the school department um, at their community distribution sites to identify. We now have eight seniors at those locations, and so we'll be able to share those meals at those locations. And if there are more, we'd like to have that ability. Um, so I am still actively recruiting anyone who would like to deliver a meal. We continue to um, deliver our Meals on Wheels. On the screen it says 35 plus. I believe that as of the close of business today, it was 51 individuals that we uh, deliver meals to in the community. Those are four routes and it includes the um, town of Pelham. And the uh, sign up and the information, uh, as I mentioned, this will be shared with the community, is available um, online. And there's that phone number. And then we are also still continuing our food distribution um, mobile services. So Western Mass Food Bank and Amherst Survival Center have two senior food distribution um, programs that occur on a monthly basis. And we've been working with them to short, sort of shift those distribution methods so that they minimize um, seniors coming out. They used to, all the bags, everything arrived here. Now we're working on getting those delivered at locations where um, groups of individuals are already located. And then again, if I can get more volunteers, we would have the ability to deliver those bags. So making sure that they have that sustenance. The, uh, the food bank is uh, commodities, so canned goods and um, dry goods. And the Amherst Survival Center once a month is uh, fresh uh, food. So it can be everything from protein and milk to fresh fruits and vegetables. And then the last program that we run for food is bread and produce, which we are still looking at how to reconfigure um, so that we can do it in a way that would be safe and support the larger community. And my last piece of... Uh, resource that I would want to draw your attention is last week we onboarded a nurse, Karen Rainin, and she also comes from um, Amherst, and she was formerly a school nurse and 
You can see a bit of her CV on the slide. Uh, her position is funded through the generous contribution of a community member, Dorothy Gavin, and she will be with us six hours a week to provide a health advice line. And that will be, uh, I think, very helpful to our seniors to have that reassuring person that they can phone, ask a few questions to that, that is health-related. So I guess in sum, I would say for anybody listening, uh, what we are most concerned with is volunteers to assist us with um, delivery of food, whether they be the bags of food or expanding Meals on Wheels. We make sure that it's done in a safe manner that is consistent with CDC and other guidelines in terms of keeping social distance, using uh, gloves, using hand sanitizer. I go out every day. I was out today. I would never ask somebody to do something that I didn't feel was safe myself. So I feel like we have sufficient riverbanks in, in place for that guidance. And um, it makes a tremendous difference because it allows us to sort of interact with that last piece of behavioral health and the social isolation and just being able to be uh, a source of resilience, a source of calm and hopefulness makes a, a, a big difference in the day of a senior. So thank you. I think thank that's it. Great. Thank you, Mary Beth. So you're looking for volunteers. What's the best way for a volunteer to contact you to see, to talk about what it takes to do it, if they're comfortable with the protocols you put in place? Do they just call you in your office, and what is that number? Yes, so the number is 413-259-3114. That is my direct number. Uh, we also, on the, the Amherst Senior Center Town website, we have a fillable form where somebody, it's called um, Offer Support, Receive Support. So if somebody wants to just email us and, and fill that out, I'm happy to have extended conversations with anybody who might be interested or curious um, in supporting our seniors. Great. Thank you very much, Mary Beth. Great job. Are there questions from the council? The only question was whether, what was the phone number to call? And oh, was, great. Mm -hmm. Do we want to go back to questions for either Paul or um, for Julie at this point? Counselors, please let us know. I will just also tell you, I'm not getting that communication, but Paul is. Are you getting that communication? So uh, there's a question for uh, from Melissa for Julie. Um, there's the, several people who have lots of questions for Julie, it looks like. So do you want to call on the people to ask those questions? Yeah, so, so the questions are from Alyssa and Kathy Shane. All right, Alyssa, let's start with you. Please unmute your mic, ask your questions, and then mute it again. Great, thank you, and thank you for all of this. So my question for Julie is more about all the immense work that's done with public health, and then there's the whole other layer of the public perception of what's being done and the public outreach. And so I appreciate that she's having to do all those things all of the time. One of the things that I think it's important to keep in mind in terms of the kinds of questions we get from the public is that it was actually public health officials who told us that young people, I'm not saying Julie did, I'm saying that told us that young people weren't as likely to be affected. And so as we continue to move forward here, I think for example, the slide that says treatment, no vaccine, I understand what she means by that, but I think it's really great if she can put out some more information when she gets a chance to breathe, whether it's copied from another source she trusts or whatever, that says, even though you're hearing about testing that vaccine, as all normal vaccines, like she said, will take a long time. In the meantime, treatment looks like this. But just saying no vaccine on a slide, I understand what that means, but I think that's not as clear to the public. And so, again, it's like she needs a whole other staff just to be able to communicate this stuff effectively. But I think offering people some more information in that regard, like, yes, you're hearing about this, but the vaccine's still out 18 months. In the meantime, here's what people do, I think would be just incredibly helpful. Okay. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, I actually have a whole team who works on the communications. So I will take that back. As Paul mentioned, we're um, 
close to setting up a more robust website so that we can have a lot of resources in one place. Um, we're also looking at onboarding some nurses so that Jennifer Brown, the public health nurse, and myself will be freed up, freed up a little bit from the calls that are coming in. Uh, but that's great feedback. Thank you. Okay. Alyssa, was there anything else? That's fine. Okay, Kathy. Hi, Julie. Um, a couple of my questions, I think, are for you and then one for Paul. Um, I have a specific question about seniors and vulnerability. At places like in Applewood, um, they, they have vans that go and take people to shop at Stop and Shop. And I don't think they discriminate among which seniors go or not. Um, so is that fine? And I... I'm asking it both because I know one 98-year-old who I told just not to get on the van, but it's a question of how many people can be in a van, can they all be going, and this is 80 to 98-year-olds are going. So that's the one question specific to an Applewood-like place, which is bringing seniors to go food shopping. And the second was about the general trying to keep groups small. If people are outside like in a park, um, the restrictions on group size, uh, does that apply and, and how big a group could be outside, um, you know, at a picnic, a family picnic? Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so you're mentioning Applewood specifically. Applewood is an independent living facility in Amherst and I was in contact with their medical staff person on Friday several times and then this morning with the, um, the managing director of Applewood. So the advice is that older people stay home and we're, when we're in our 90s, we're older. Um, that being said, people are still being allowed to go to the grocery store uh, it's a personal decision. I think Applewood is doing a fantastic job in educating their residents about how to protect themselves. I think you bring up an interesting question about vans, so I will circle back to Applewood. We did not specifically talk about that. I know frequently on the vans there are often just one or two people, which would be fine. Um, so I'll move on to your second question, which is about parks. So the governor is using the number of 10 people to be out and about. Um, I think what's really important is to just look at the basic facts of social distancing. So what we really want is for people to be six feet apart. That being said, a household, so a family of four or five, they're living together, <clears throat> and so if they're going out and they're gonna be together getting some exercise, playing outside, which is wonderful, thank goodness spring is, it was coming, I think it still is. Um, so we wanna see people outside. The kind of thing that is discouraged is a group of people playing basketball and touching that basketball, throwing a frisbee to each other, unless they're household contacts. So the number 10 is used because it's so much easier for people to think about a number and what that means to congregate, congregate in that way. But what we're really asking people to do is have six foot social distancing. So tell me if you want, to clar want me to clarify either of my answers. Uh, no, those were both very, they were both very clear. I mean, in this, um, uh, and then the one I have that's um, more for you, Paul, is around in the governor's order, it sounded like uh, it was possible to impose as much as a $300 fine and even jail time if um, people don't observe the don't gather. Um, is that going to be strictly enforced in Amherst? I was asked this by a resident. Um, you know, Are we going to be just trying to get the word out there, just don't do it? That's my second question. Yeah, so that we talked, we discussed some of this this morning with our um, police chief, and the role we play is for as an education role and a, a sort of intervention role, and you know, if there are complaints about noise uh, or or large gatherings, we will address those. 
Um, the police have introduced new protocols. They won't just wade into a large crowd. They have uh, new, system, new ways of approaching that. But um, you know, as much as we can, we want it to be educational. We don't really have uh, plans for uh, uh, introducing fines or anything like that at this point in time. Okay, Paul, are there any other questions? Yes, so um, Shalini has a question about Craig's list, but I think it's Craig's doors. Okay. <laughs> I've lost Yes, questions. Craig's doors, please. <laughs> Go ahead, Shalini. Oh, I was just uh, hoping we could get an update on um, the status of, um, for people who are living in or uh, visiting Craig's doors. And also, if there are any resources, or what can, how can we help people who are uh, fearful of being evicted right now because they can't pay rent? So, yeah, those two questions. Thank you. Thank you, Shalini. This is Julie. I'll take the first question. So we've been working very closely with Craig's Doors, and what we've instituted. Well, time really morphs, so I'm going to say about 10 days ago, perhaps longer, is that all guests, when they arrive at the shelter, are being screened by medical professionals, physicians' assistants, doctors, or nurse practitioners. So they're getting their temperatures taken, they're being assessed for possible signs of illness, um, their lungs are being listened to if they have any signs of illness. And they did some, they're doing some um, initial baseline assessment of lungs for folks who are smokers also. Those staff are, all, those volunteers, those are folks who are volunteering after their full-time jobs, are then um, being very helpful with shelter staff to help them come up with the best type of cot arrangement so that people have the most distance when they're sleeping head to head. They're, they've also been helping them with creative ideas around serving dinner, also um, helping them with sanitation and evaluating the sanitation, which has been excellent. So we're really thankful for these volunteers, and I think I'll just put a shout out now that Craig Stores is looking for more medical volunteers, MDs, nurse practitioners, or physician's assistants to volunteer between 9 and 10.30. It often goes till 11. And if anyone is able to volunteer, um, that would be greatly appreciated as these folks are traveling an hour to do this late at night. Mm -hmm. um, the contact for that is Kevin Noonan. It's his email address, which I'm going to stumble over right now. So we will try and get that up on the screen. Um, the other thing they're looking for at Craig's Doors is, as we saw students who are not in town, many of them were volunteers at the shelter, so regular volunteers to help set up the cots are also needed. That would be, every night, that would be between about 7 and 9 p.m. So I think I will pass it on to Paul, and uh, meanwhile I will see if I can get Kevin's address, email address up there. So I think the second question was about evictions. Um, and I think the governor addressed that. I didn't hear the entire press conference today because uh, we were at a meeting. But um, I think he uh, answered that explicit question by saying that the courts are not open. So there, there's, there are no eviction proceedings moving forward. But I would have to find a more detailed answer to that question. Um, so. That's the, the other thing I just want to point out is uh, what, the, what his order actually says is that all businesses and other organizations that do not provide COVID-19 essential services shall close their physical workplaces and facilities, brick and mortar premises, to workers, customers, and the public as of 12 noon on March 24, 2020, and shall not reopen to workers, customers, or the public before 12 noon on April 7, 2020. And they have some exceptions, of course, for the essential workers and for churches, temples, mosques, and other places of worship. Okay. Are there any other questions? Please uh, indicate by sending a... Darcy has a question. Okay. Darcy? Oh, um, I just um, saw the emails that were um, sent by Jerry Weiss this 
We can you hear me all right? Yes, but it's a little. You may actually need to back off of your mic a little bit. Oh, um, uh, I just was wondering uh, what the answer was to the question that was being debated over email this week about um, what whether there's a plan that is in place um, in case a resident of Craig's door doors test positives for COVID-19, um, what would then happen? Oops. Thank you for that question. Yes, we've been working on this. Um, in fact, we spent much of the weekend working on this. So we are identifying where someone who, one or more people who test positive for COVID-19 who are shelter, shelter guests could stay so that they have adequate isolation, they have monitoring and support, and all the things that they need. We're also looking at the same time for where we would be able to quarantine the rest of the shelter guests because that would be needed also. So we've got a team of about five or six people actively engaged in identifying those sites. And is there, uh, okay, so you have some sites all potentially ready to go if that were to happen today or? We are essentially prepared should that happen today. Yes. Okay. I don't think we're seeing it on the TV screen, but uh, Kevin Noonan's email address is Kevin, K E V I N, at Craig's Doors, all one word, C R A I G S D O O R S dot org. Uh, Evan Ross has a question. Okay, Evan. Hey, this uh, should be real quick uh, for Paul. So I saw that the governor's order uh, exempted construction, um, especially around public works. And so my assumption is that any current projects we have going right now, like the multi-use path on East Hadley Road, will be ongoing uh, throughout. So when we uh, pray, we look at our work, we look at what can be d accomplished using proper social distance um, uh, protocols. And our assessment at this point is twofold. One is that these projects can be uh, accommodated using social distancing. And secondly, we think it's vital to keep as much of the economy moving, moving forward as we can, as long as we're observing the um, social distancing rules. So a lot of outdoor work, uh, as long as it's people not working uh, closely together, can be moved can move forward, and we will we will continue to do that as best we can. And it's a lot of the protocols we we, we identify them, and these are uh, work. This is work that is being done by private contractors as well. Okay. Are there other questions from the council? Please indicate by typing to us you have a question. Okay. Uh, again, I want to urge the public to feel free to send us any questions you may have through towncouncil at amherstma.org. Right after our meeting last week, we received a series of really amazingly good questions, and the person got amazingly good responses. So uh, we also have an opportunity to add, when we have time, the frequently asked questions on our website. So um, with that, I think we're ready then to go on to the next part of our meeting. Um, we're going to start with our consent agen agenda. And the consent agenda, unless you tell me differently, includes the following. Mary Beth Ogilevitz is now exiting. OK. Um, these items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting, ask that it be removed when the president, president lists the consent agenda items. The request to remove an item from the consent agenda does not require a second. 
The items in the motion are the Town Council's Rules of Procedure 8.2, 8.6, and 10.3. The approval of the March 9, 2020 minutes and the approval of the March 16, 2020 Special Town Council minutes. Is there any item you would like removed? Please communicate with us by typing. Ooh, sorry about that. I will correct that. All right, let's finish this and then I want to go back and correct the uh, uh, email address for the Town Council. Uh, so the consent agenda is to move the following items and the printed motions therein, there under and approve those items as a single unit. Uh, 7D, Town Council Rules of Procedure, Rules 8.2, 8.6, and 10.3. I need a second. Oh, hold on, I have two more. 10A, approval of March 9, 2020 Town Council meeting minutes as presented, and 10B, approval of March 16, 2020 Special Town Council meeting minutes as presented. Mandy seconds. Okay, thank you. We have to do this by roll call vote since we are all um, remote. So let me start by uh, asking for the vote. Shalini? You have to unmute, please. Oh, yes. Alyssa Brewer? Aye. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Darcy, aye. Darcy Dumont? Yes. Lynn Griesmer votes aye. Uh, Mandy Jo Haneke? Yes. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Evan Ross? Yes. George Ryan? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Steve Schreiber? Aye. Andy Steinberg? Yes. And Sarah Schwartz? Aye. Okay. Uh, we have two, the next two items on our agenda. Oh, the motion passed 1300. Uh, we have two agenda items that come next. Last week, uh, the town manager shared, or actually declared a state of emergency and shared that in your packet. We would like to ask the town council to ratify uh, the town manager's March 16th, 2020 state of emergency declaration. That is a, a motion. Is there a second? Mandy seconds. Okay. Is there, are there questions? Please let us know by sending a question or a statement that you want to ask a question. Shalini has a question. Shalini, please speak. Um, yes, I support this uh, motion. I just wanted a clarification and maybe for the public. Uh, what does this entail? What does it mean for the people? What does it mean for the town council? Um, yes, thank you. Okay, Paul, please. Thank you for that, Shalini. Um, there, uh, pretty much every community, or most communities in the Commonwealth have declared a state of emergency. Um, the implications aren't uh, really broad, but they may come into play later or down the road. So, for instance, um, some uh, insurance policies may require a state of emergency in the locality to be in place before they respond to a certain uh, kind of claim that a, 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 a private property owner or individual or business may have. Um, if we are seeking additional funds from the federal government or um, state government, the fact that we declared a state of emergency may help our case. It may not be required. And in talking to our town attorney, uh, the town attorney's advice and they've said was that it's better safe than sorry on these things. And um, if, as long as, you know, and, and so that's why we pushed it forward to have a state of emergency um, move forward. It, it just helps us in terms of uh, communicating to the public as well that this is a very serious um, pandemic and that and the town is taking it seriously. Are there other questions about the state of emergency? OK, 
Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. There'll be a roll call vote. Uh, we'll start this time with Alyssa Brewer. Brewer says aye. Uh, DeAngelis. Aye. Dumont. Yes. Griesmer says aye. Haneke. Aye. Pam. Aye. Ross. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Shane. Aye. Schreiber. Aye. Steinberg. Aye. Schwartz. Aye. And Bell Milne. Yes. Okay. Uh, then the next item is new on this agenda, and let me just give you a little context or background, and that is by the charter, the libraries and the schools are required to advance to us a budget, advance to the town manager a budget by April 1st, and then the town manager is required to advance to the town council his, his proposed budget for FY21 by May 1st. Those deadlines need to be extended because we expect some potential impact on this year with things like re state revenues and also possibly even town revenues from things like real estate taxes. And so what we would like to do and what the motion is, is to move those dates so that respectively the uh, library and the schools would not advance their budgets to us until May 1st and the town manager would not advance his budget to us until June 1st. In discussing this and based on the kind of experience we went through Last year with the budget, thank heavens, we have one year of experience as a council. Um, however, this would allow us to get some, have an opportunity to possibly make some adjustments. And um, we also are very aware that the governor and the legislature are looking and I began, I believe even today began discussing the bill that actually would extend these deadlines. We also know that at present, uh, many of the, or a couple of the surrounding towns that join us on the regional school budget are already delaying their town meetings until May or June. Anything further on that, Paul, that you want to give us background? I think the memo speaks for itself. Um, there are questions from Shalini, Alyssa, uh, and Andrew Steinberg, and uh, Mandy Jo. Okay, let's start with Shalini. Um, I was just, um, I think it would be helpful to me to understand what the repercussions are going to be, and I mean, they are going to be, and I don't see how we can avoid postponing this, but... Um, is there any way we can understand what the repercussions are going to be of pushing the budget forward and um, and how can we prepare for it? And uh, uh, Mandy Jo has a procedural question, but if I can answer uh, Shalini's question first. And Please you can go ahead. Um, so uh, we don't know exactly the ramifications. We believe that we, for the last quarter of FY20, we will see a significant reduction in many of our um, uh, um, revenue sources, including um, hotel and motel meals tax, uh, hotel and motel taxes, meals taxes, uh, parking revenue, uh, things like that. Uh, we anticipate that this will extend into, FY, into the FY21 budget, so we don't have um, the March numbers yet which will give us a bit of an indication on where we will be headed. Um, and there will also likely be delays in people paying their taxes. So I think there will be a significant Im impact. And uh, we may not have all the answers by the time it comes to make a decision, but this gives us a bit more time to have more clarity that we can present to the council and to the public as we prepare our budgets. I want to go to Mandy Joe and ask about the procedural question. 
Yeah, sorry about this, but I realized we probably need to suspend 8.4 to vote on this tonight. So it will require another roll call vote. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll move to suspend. We'll do that when we get to the actual motions. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, Alyssa. Thank you. I realize everything is a moving target, but speaking of people paying, and we know that at least Springfield, for example, has said they will not penalize people for paying their vehicle excise taxes late. I realize that it would be much better, like with most things, if the governor just made a decision or the legislature made a decision. But in the meantime, what are we to tell people we're planning to do? Are we going to say that we're absolutely waiting for this, a state level decision to be made? Or are we going to assure people that we are not going to penalize them for not driving up to town hall to stick something in a slot or being willing to do it online, especially if they're worried about paying other things in their lives. Paul? Thank you. That's a really good question because we get that. I was speaking with the MMA today. We're hopeful that the legislature will pass a blanket application of the waiving of late fees and penalties. We have, there, there is limited discretion the town has at this moment in terms of what we can waive and what we can't waive. Uh, we would take the most, we would take as many steps as we can as permitted under uh, state law. But we're hoping that the state would recognize this as a pretty important thing um, for, for everybody in the, in the Commonwealth. Let's look for an update on next week's agenda on that very issue, okay? So on the agenda on March 30th, look for an update on whether or not the late fees would be suspended on things like excise tax, real estate tax, et cetera. Anything else, Alyssa? Thank you, that's perfect. Andy. Thank you. So I just wanted to um, briefly uh, state something in support of the motion that we're gonna be getting very soon. Uh, I was uh, on the Finance Committee in 2008 and 2009, and that's significant because if you recall, we had a recession in 2008 and 2009 was when we were developing the budget for 2010 fiscal year, and it was a very difficult plan was continually changing throughout the development of the budget process. And um, I recognize that the governor um, and lieutenant governor were involved in local government maybe back then because uh, they were very, the governor was very quick to propose um, legislation which was being considered today in the legislature um, in which I've had some communication with um, both our senator and representative about to provide the kind of flexibility that cities and towns did not have back at that time. Um, and uh, we need to, um, we, we would have benefited greatly by having that flexibility back in 2009. I'm uh, um, pleased that we have it now. And um, I would uh, therefore um, urge that we take advantage of that flexibility. Um, I also wanted to just comment that in the end, we did adopt a budget and it did serve the town for the year of 2010. And we began to rebuild our financial strength after that. Um, and uh, we came out of it very strong. And I think with the kind of planning um, again, uh, we're cap we know we're capable of, I think that we can come out of this strong again. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the council? Okay, then I'm gonna make two motions. The first one we'll do, and then we'll do the vote. Uh, the first one is move to suspend town council rules of procedure 8.4. Is there a second? Man Mandy seconds. Okay. Then the roll call vote, this time we're going to start with Pat. See, I learned well from Athena. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, Darcy? Yes. Lynn Griesmer says yes. Haneke? Yes. Dorothy, Pam? Dorothy, Pam. 
You're on mute, Dorothy. Yeah. Yes. Thank I'm now you. unmuted. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Yes. Chalini Ball Milne. Yes. And Alyssa Brewer. Yes. All right. Then we're going to move on to the larger motion. The larger motion is to grant the exceptions requested by the town manager on March 23rd, 2020, under Charter Section 5.9, to modify the deadline established in Charter Section 5.4A for the Amherst School Committee, Regional School Committee, and Library Trustees to submit their proposed adopted budgets for fiscal year 2021 to the town manager from April 1st, 2020 to May 1st, 2020. And the deadline established in Charter Section 5.4B for the town manager to submit a proposed budget for fiscal year 2021 to the town council from May 1st, 2020 to June 1st, 2020 due to the extra time needed because of the governor's declaration of a state of emergency related to COVID-19. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay. <laughs> Is there any further discussion at this time? Then a roll call vote. This time we start with Darcy. Yes. Griesmer says yes. Haneke. Yes. Pam. Yes. Ross. Yes. Ryan. Yes. Schoen. Yes. Schreiber. Yes. Steinberg. Yes. Schwartz. Yes. Ball Milne. Yes. Brewer. Yes. And DeAngelis. Yes. Okay. Um, we don't have a lot left on this agenda, so let me just go on and say, uh, posted with the agenda tonight are the latest draft of the questions for the school committee. Not only do I not personally like group editing, but doing it virtually is just out of the question. And so I have asked individual counselors without replying all to send me changes or requested changes in those questions. I resent that email to you today and ask that you have it back to me by Thursday. The school committee is meeting on Friday, uh, I mean on Thursday in the afternoon. And at that point, uh, after that, both um, the school committee chair and I will meet again, meet, meaning by virtually, and spend some more time trying to come up with our final set of questions. Are there questions about how we're going to go forward developing this? Yes. Paul. Alyssa has a question, and uh, Evan has a comment, and Mandy Jo has a question, or multiple questions. Okay, who is the first one? Alyssa. Alyssa, please go forward. Thank you. Um, Lynn knows, as, as Lynn said, she said we, we could comment to her individually, and I did. I see some serious shortcomings in those questions, which I think are partly due to um, inexperience at doing questions of this nature for this type of process. So I would just like our and I believe she's going to take that into account when she talks with Allison. I totally trust that process. So I would just like our motion to be rephrased to indicate that we say, yep, you're doing the questions and the questions will finally be done by Lynn and Allison. Not that we quote, approve these questions or approve next week's questions, because like you said, a group editing process isn't going to work. I want it to somehow be clear that we're giving you the authority to finish this, not that we are approving that set of questions because mm -hmm. that set of questions is something I can't approve. Although, and I just want to point out that the motion and vote up here is not tonight. That should not, the, it's not on the um, agenda at this time. The, uh, if I could follow up then? Yes. Then, and actually, I would rather we didn't vote at all. I would rather that we say okay. that we, by consensus, agree 
that you are undertaking this extra responsibility for us to do with this chair of the school committee, not that we are ever going to approve the set of questions because good luck with that with 13 people plus the school committee members. So I would say it's just a report out. I would say it's never a vote. So I would ask you to consider that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Evan, you had questions. Yeah, so a couple comments, actually, I'll be that guy. Um, so thank you for not doing a virtual group editing. First off, I think that would be a nightmare. Um, just a, a couple brief comments. One is I, I understand that the list of questions is probably everything that's on the table right now or everything that's being considered uh, sort of taken from what everyone submitted. Um, but it's my sincere hope that the final uh, list will be far shorter. Um, I don't know how many candidates we have right now, um, and perhaps the list length could adapt to that, but if we had four candidates, you're looking at at least two hours of interviews based on how many questions we have now, um, and, and the number of questions is just too long. So I'm hoping we can um, scale that down. Uh, I agree with Alyssa that I think it'd be really tough for us to vote on any particular list of questions without it turning into a group editing. And so I think that uh, I support the idea of just uh, voting to empower the president um, to, to come up with the list. Um, and the last thing I do want to say is one thing that's made me sort of uncomfortable throughout this whole process is the fact that we're filling a school committee slot and yet uh, the town council has sort of outsized weight in this just because of our sheer numbers when it comes to actually voting. Um, and so anywhere that we can give deference to the school committee um, and empower them would be useful. And so my personal hope is that as we go into finalizing questions with you and with um, Allison, uh, that those questions that were, if you have to pare down the number of questions, that the questions submitted by school committee members are prioritized over those that are submitted by counselors, because after all, this is one of their members. Can I? Yeah. I just want to note the queue that uh, we have Mandy Jo, Kathy Shane, Darcy Dumont, Dorothy, mm -hmm. Pam, and then Alyssa Brewer again. Mandy Jo, Kathy, Dorothy, Darcy, and Darcy. Okay. Dorothy and Darcy. <laughs> Okay, and then Alyssa. Okay, so let me just answer a little bit about that. In back, in a, and I will make sure next week in the packet you have the full set of documents again, not just the questions. Uh, but we've made a couple serious efforts uh, to make sure that the school committee feels a level of equal participation with the council, even though when the final vote is done, there are 13 of us and only four of them. Um, the first of those was uh, to meet with Allison and develop the process. The second of those was um, to make sure that as we developed that process and it was up for discussion, that the school committee had an equal opportunity to discuss that. I actually attended the school committee meeting when we were still meeting in person. And uh, there were some suggestions made and we actually incorporated it. The third was the school committee themselves developed the description of expectations and responsibilities that will appear, at, did appear in your last packet, but it will appear in the final packet sent out. And then finally, um, I, let's, I think Allison and I spent about an hour and a half uh, on the phone on Saturday coming up with this latest draft and we've already set a time to talk about that this coming Friday. So I'm trying, she's collecting kind of where the school committee is coming from and I'm collecting where the council's coming from and um, I think it's very important that we see the school committee as a partner in this process. Um, Mandy Jo? Yes, thank you. Um, I actually want, I was, one of my questions was how many questions are going to end up on this list because I do agree with Evan that this list is way too long um, for in person if this is going to be presented to the candidates um, for writing answers that that might be a way to to limit some of the in person questions. But I, I'm going to add my two cents on 
the list and whether we should vote on it. Um, I actually disagree with Evan and Alyssa, and I think we should have some say in that, because if we're paring down this list from two pages and 20 some questions to five questions or four questions, I think it's important that since we won't be able to ask any other questions of these candidates, that it's important that the council and the school committee actually do agree on what those four or five are if they become really small, if we do get down to a level like that, because, you know, we may not agree exactly, but but I think we should know which ones are getting asked and have a say in that. Okay. Um, Kathy. Okay, I'll try not to repeat what's already been said because people brought up some points. Um, I will echo that I had already said to comment that this is long. I do want to say that I think one of the perspectives that the council should be trying to bring to this, and I think it is in a lot of these questions, is that this would normally um, be an elected position where people would be facing questionnaires that league put up and others put up and they would be doing responses. So it's not quite the same as this, a committee choosing their next member. So that's why both perspectives are important. And I think I would like to echo what Mandy just said that I, because I think it needs to be pared down, having us see and, um, have a say or at least have input on what is almost final would be important. And I think we had the time to do that. Okay. Um, Darcy. Yeah, um, I would agree with Mandy, Joe, and Kathy that, um, that it makes sense for us to have some input into the questions and also that, uh, and agree with everyone that there are too many questions. Um, I did wonder, and maybe, I don't know if I missed something, but I know that OCA always, when it's doing this type of thing, has also a list of criteria that will be looked at in making a decision about whom to choose. And so I, I didn't see that anywhere of, um, you know, what, 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 the t what the two bodies will be looking at to make their final choices. Um, and, um, and that, you know, that came to mind in reading the questions because some of the questions m make you wonder, well, what, what is it that the body is getting at here? Uh, what, is, what is the good answer to this question? Um, and uh, um, I actually, like the fact that there were some questions that seemed to get at having a diversity of voices on the school committee um, that would give us an idea that there might be a diversity of voices. Um, so that was that would be something that I'd be interested in talking about around you know the questions that we include. Thank you. Uh, let me, let's hold off on the discussion of criteria until after we have any other input tonight on the issue of questions. So, Dorothy, I believe you're next. Yes, I would just like to quote Willie Lohman, who says, the woods are burning. I think we're spending too much time on this. There are much more important things that we should be doing. I think that I like the first motion that said that Lynn and Allison should get together and make the list of questions, period. Okay, and Alyssa? I'll try and be quick since I spoke on this previously. Following up on the selection criteria, I appreciate that you're saying we'll talk about that at another time, but I also appreciate what you said earlier about the primacy of the school committee in this discussion. They wrote the handout, they're having significant influence on the questions, and they should indeed, as Darcy said, be writing the selection criteria so that we know how to interpret the answers. The other two items that I was concerned about is that, for example, the question on the dual language program is entirely inappropriate. That's because most of the people who ran for school committee in the last couple of years didn't have any idea how that process got to the point that it was while they were running, when they were going to the league, when they were having coffees at people's houses, et cetera. That's something you learn about 
once you're on the school committee. And so I str- I will never vote to say yes to a question like that, which is why I feel much more comfortable saying, if you guys disagree with me and you and Allison end up going ahead and putting that in, I'll do that, but I will never vote for a question that specific because it's entirely inappropriate. The other thing in terms of looking forward because of all the other pressures we're under, I would really think it would be an excellent idea at this point, even though it sounds like more work, I think it will actually be less work in the long run if we come up with two alternates, One is verbal questions, one is written questions. If things get more difficult for people to participate, but yet we aren't willing to postpone altogether, right? Because there's obviously a continuum here. If we are, things get more difficult, it may make more sense to ask people to provide written answers, in which case the questions could look different, while of course bearing in mind that once you start writing essay questions, you're going to be preventing some people from participating because in all reality, school committee members don't have to write position papers. So I think having those two alternatives available to us, even if you just tell us it's verbally, if you don't have two separate documents, is fine. But I think that's really worth considering up front rather than saying, oh, it's three days from now and things have gone wrong. So let's go ahead and turn these into written questions because we all know they're not going to be as good if we do it that way. Alyssa, may I ask a qualifying question about your recommendation? Are you suggesting that there be some questions people are asked to write and other questions that they will answer verbally? I, I am suggesting that there could be such a hybrid. There could also be a scenario under which we only did written questions and we voted and deliberated based entirely on people not participating. Um, actually verbally participating in their own interview, so to speak just like we do with, say, um, you know, when, when the town council talks about who OCA recommended to them, we don't ask those people to participate then at that point in the process. Looking at a, a, position, a, a position we may find ourselves in where the candidates are not able to, act, to, to connect up with us, you know, like the problems we had earlier tonight, just to be able to technically be able to move to written questions and answers and then just evaluate that and deliberate based on that. But perhaps a hybrid is the best of both worlds. I don't know. But giving ourselves those options early on rather than scrambling to do them two days before the meeting, I think would be really helpful. Okay. Thank you. Um, Kathy, you had another question. I'm, I'm just trying, going to echo what I think Dorothy was asking for. Um, I think many of us have comments on specific questions, and I, I don't want to take the time tonight. So I just would urge us all to be very specific in the comments we give to Lynn as she goes into this next iteration, and then we come back to the contents and and the possible options for how we do this okay. interview. All right. Thank you. Um, Paul, are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, and if there's no other questions, then we're going to move on uh, with the rest of the agenda. Um, let me just ask if there's any committees that feel they need to report at this time. Evan, please move forward. Yeah, just really brief. OCA is going to be meeting on Monday the 30th, um, and the primary purpose of that meeting is to develop interview questions for Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, I sent out an email last week asking if any counselors had questions that they wanted to submit. Uh, I've heard from one counselor so far, no one is required to submit, um, but if you do want to submit questions for the ZBA interviews, um, if you could do so by end of day Friday, so I can collate them and OCA can discuss them on Monday, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other committee reports at this time? So Mandy Jo says no for CRC. George says no for GOL. Okay. Um, and so let me just tell you our estimated dates for these next meetings. Uh, community resources, the estimated date is April 8th. Um, the Finance Committee, the estimated date of the next meeting is April 7th. Uh, for GOL, it's April 8th. 
for JCPC April 8th, but that could change based on some additional conversation. Um, out OCA is March 30th, as just stated, and the Town Services and Outreach Committee, I will be polling for April 6th at 9.30 in the morning. Okay, is there any other question on committees? We've done the approval of minutes. Paul, do you have any further things you'd like to report on? I think he's probably ready to hang it up for the day. I have no other comments. Do any other counselors have other comments or items that you would like to see on future agendas? And let me just mention that next week, um, we have been discussing the possibility of finding, hearing a little more about some of the human services and food programs that are out there uh, as an additional feature for the public. But if there's additional items, please let me know. Darcy has a comment. Darcy? Yeah, um, yes, I just wanted to, to again repeat that, um, and I'm really glad the town is um, looking more at the possibility of getting public comment through Zoom or in some other way um, at our next meeting. And uh, um, I invite people to look at the Northampton um, March 16th meeting that they did by Zoom, the city council meeting, and um, the way they incorporated public comment was, it seemed very easy. Um, so if we could look at something like that, I, I would really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Darcy. In fact, the irony is that two or three of our town staff actually looked at the meeting. At one point, Paul was even called on because all of a sudden he showed up as a participant. Uh, so, and the uh, technology, we expect to make a decision as a town by Tuesday or Wednesday of this week uh, and make a decision based on how we can, in fact, create the best um, experience for both the counselors as well as for the public to participate. Okay? Great. All right. Um, anything else, counselor comments at this time? Mm -hmm. We have already dealt with the one topic that was less than 48 hours, and we have already done an executive session, and I believe last week you declared that I was allowed to say the meeting is adjourned. Yes? The meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much for your time, counselors. I am working hard to get these meetings down to fewer hours, and thanks for our assistance from both the town staff and from Amherst Media.